Hi, my name is Michael Andrew, and I'm about to give you a free tutorial on the Panasonic S1. It should mostly apply to the S1R as well. This is Panasonic's new full-frame mirrorless camera. The viewfinder is ridiculous. If you're coming from another system or you're an experienced photographer already, check out the table of contents. Go Control F or Command F, type in your keyword, and if we have a chapter marker for it, you will be able to jump directly to that part of the video. We spent a lot of time putting that together. This video is designed to replace the user's manual that came with your camera. Some people prefer books. I am more of a visual learner and like to watch somebody else do it and follow along. If you are a beginning or an intermediate photographer and still new to photography, a word of warning I have to give you is this video deals with the camera operation only. It's not going to be enough for you to go out and take spectacular images. I teach all of my students to see it in your mind's eye. This is where the magic happens, is in your brain. You use the camera as an extension. And when I first started, I was so frustrated that I could see what I wanted to do here. I couldn't get those images out of the camera. And I spent two years of frustration trying to figure it out. And at the end of it, I, I realized there's so much more information to know beyond operating the camera. There are the photography basics and composition and lighting. Now we're dealing with digital files and there's some planning and troubleshooting involved. Then each of the real world shooting situations have different philosophies of use. Even the focusing systems from subject to subject are different. Once I finally started learning the camera, I realized that there was a lack of good video training where somebody could just sit down and in a few hours learn their camera system. You don't need to read the manual. You don't need to read a 500 page book sit down and watch somebody with experience do it. And that is where the Panasonic S1 and S1R crash course is coming from. I've been doing this for 12 years now, full time, and I will take you through a known established system of becoming a great photographer. If you're interested in that, check out the link in the description. It'll take you to my blog, leave your name and your email address, and we will reach out to you as soon as it's ready. In any event, we have a lot of information to cover, like a ton, so let's get started. Let's take a look at the external buttons and ports on the Panasonic S1 and S1R. The first is the shutter button, which has two phases. The first is a halfway depression, and the second is a full depression, which will actually take the picture. It's very important to train your finger to feel where that first depression point is. It's very soft step down. You'll feel it immediately, and it's very important to train your finger to know the difference between the half depression and the full depression that will take the picture. Directly in front of the shutter button, we have the front dial. I like to call this the primary selector. You will notice that it rotates to the left and right. On the back far right of our camera, we have a rear control dial, which I also like to call the secondary selector for a very good reason I will show you later. On the far left of the camera, we have the mode dial. This will allow us to determine how much help the camera will give us when shooting. And we also have the video record mode here. Looking on the top of the camera, we have four buttons and an LCD display. The LCD will show critical shooting information, such as your shutter speed, your aperture, your ISO, things of that nature. We are going to be looking at it quite a bit. The buttons are going left to right, white balance, ISO, and exposure, compensation. You will notice that the ISO button is dimpled to give you a tactile reference when looking through the viewfinder. The button with the light bulb will illuminate our LCD and some of our rear control buttons in dark situations. The power switch is located immediately to the right of the lamp button and we will need to turn this on every time we want to shoot. On the front of the camera near the right grip we have three buttons. The bottom is the lens release, which we must press every time we want to take a lens off. Above it, we have two customizable function buttons, which we can determine how they will work in our menu systems. By default, the second button is a depth of field preview button. On the inside of the grip, we have an autofocus assist lamp. There's a good chance you're going to be shooting with a 24 to 105, but if not, notice that many lenses have an autofocus to manual focus switch, and in this case, an image stabilization switch, as well as a lens barrel lock switch. Just above the logo, we have the PC Sync terminal, which will allow us to connect to a studio strobe by wire, 
And at the base of the camera, we have a customizable function lever. At the base of the mode dial, we have the drive modes, which tells the camera what to do after we push the shutter button down all the way. For example, a burst or maybe a timer mode. The LVF button is the monitor viewfinder button, which allows us to determine whether the camera is displaying through the EVF or the back monitor or automatically switching when we look into the EVF. And by the way, the EVF is absolutely spectacular. It's the best I've ever seen. At the base of the EVF, we have the diopter adjustment, which will allow us to change the focus very handy if you wear corrective eyewear. On the back of the camera, in the top right, we have a lock switch, which will allow us to lock out certain buttons from changing anything should we accidentally bump them. We have the playback button, which will display images after we take them. The monitor tilts up and down, and pushing the button on the far left up will allow the monitor to tilt to the right. On the right side of the EVF, we have the V mode button, which will allow for viewfinder magnification. And just below and to the right of the EVF, we have the start and stop video record button. To the right of it, we have the auto focus mode lever, in the center of which we have the cluster selector button, which I will demonstrate later. Immediately to the right of that, we have the auto focus on button, which is great for back button focusing. And below it, we have the joystick, which is very handy to navigate menu items or to change our focus selector when looking through the electronic viewfinder. Below the joystick, we have the Q button, which will allow us to access our quick menu. Below the Q button, we have a large wheel. This is the control dial, and there are actually several controls built in here. In the center, we have the menu and set button, which allows us to enter the deep menu and it also acts as an enter button on a computer when selecting menu items. This control dial also has a rotating wheel and a directional pad which can be used and customized in a number of different ways. The cancel button will help us backing out of menu items and the garbage can button will allow us to delete images. Toggling the display button will control how different sets of information are being displayed. Under the right grip, we have our memory card slots, which allows us to store a UHS-2 SD memory card on top and an XQD memory card on the bottom. On the far left side of the camera, under the gaskets, we have our remote terminal, microphone and headphone jack, USB-C terminal for data and charging, and a full-size HDMI port. Beneath the camera, we have the battery slot and our battery grip pin connector. So that's an overview of the camera. We've gone over all the buttons and have briefly covered what they do. I promise that if you practice, the day will come that you will feel you have complete control over your camera and it feels really good to know how to do everything. There may come a time when you forget which button does what, just come on back and we'll go over it again. For the rest of this video, we'll go through most of these settings individually so you know what they are and what they do. So there's a couple things I want to show before we get into the actual lessons. You'd be surprised how many photographers don't know that this is the front cap from the 24 to 105. Under the cap of every lens, there should be the filter thread size, 77 millimeters. That's important on the crash course. We're going to be using filters and things of that nature. So you'll need to know the size of your lens. That's where you look. The body cap has a little dimple right here, and this is going to tell us where to line it up when we put it back on. It can be frustrating if you lose track of that. And we're gonna take that off. Beautiful sensor, by the way. Every lens should have a red dot, and that red dot is going to line up here. I don't like to leave this exposed, you know, for as short as possible. And then we're gonna rotate it until it clicks. Now, every time we take the lens off, we're gonna to have to push down and hold that bottom button to unlock it. Make sure you hear it click all the way before you start shooting. When we're talking about the memory cards, it's important to note that it's not just a matter of sliding this lever down. We actually have to push back towards the back of the camera. On the top, we have our SD memory card slot. It's UHS-2 compatible. If you're shooting 4K video, you can use SD-1 cards. The main thing is that it's a Class U3. I like these Extreme Pros. They have been very reliable for me. Haven't had any problems with them. And then below it, we have an XQD memory card. It's really designed for speed. This is an incredibly fast card. So if you're trying to buffer images quickly and get them written to the memory card, 
this one's going to be blazingly fast. Just a couple basics before we get into the main lesson is if this is your first camera, and there are some of you this is, or if you're coming from another camera system that you're familiar with, take a moment to feel how soft that halfway shutter button depression is to, to attain focus lock. And pushing down all the way, you don't get a click or anything. It's almost like, hey, where's the click? Another thing I want to point out is that the mode dial has a center post that must be depressed when we're rotating the dial. When we're not pushing it, it remains locked, and this is by default. It's a very nice design to prevent little bumpages and things of that nature. Obviously, we're going to need to turn the camera on. If you haven't gotten already, grab your camera and let's walk through this together. I want to demonstrate how to navigate around through the camera before we get into our mode lesson. This button here on the bottom says display. Get into the habit of toggling through that so you can see different sets of information being displayed on our back monitor. And you can expect to see something similar in your viewfinder. In the bottom left hand corner, this M is the mode that we are shooting on. This is our metering mode, this symbol, we'll be talking about that later. But right here, these guys are very important. This is your shutter speed and the number that has the F in front of it is your aperture. Plus minus, this is our exposure compensation. These are our memory cards in terms of how they're being used, number of shots remaining, battery life, image stabilization. This is the focusing cluster we're using. This is our focusing mode. This is the quality type. And these are our picture styles, which we'll be talking a little bit about each of these separately. As I push the display button, oh, and this is obviously a level, this is our side to side level on the outside. And if we were to tilt the camera up or down, we could see those two tick marks in the center changing. If I push the display button, all that goes away. As I continue to toggle it, we get this black information screen. So lots of info in here, covering it real quick. This is our mode, shutter speed, aperture. This is our Wi-Fi connection, battery life. Our ISO, exposure compensation, flash exposure compensation. These are our drive modes, our focusing modes, our focusing clusters, our quality, aspect ratio, HLG indicator, custom functions. These are our picture controls, auto white balance, auto dynamic range, metering modes. This is a little confusing. Number one is our XQD card slot, even though it's listed on the top. And then the one with the corner missing is our SD card slot. And the reason we know this is that if you open up the door and you look, it'll, it'll actually have a number next to it. So it, this is not top to bottom. This is one on the bottom, two on the top. Something that's cool about the black screen is this is mostly touch interactive. So we can touch on our shutter speed and we can touch and drag our shutter speed. You'll notice that the display is staying the same. We can touch and drag our aperture. We can touch and drag our exposure compensation. See how it's getting brighter and, brighter and darker. We can touch and drag our ISO, which is nice. Auto ISO is great. We can also control a lot of these things with the dedicated button. So as we're shooting, we have you know, our white balance button. That'll take us straight into the menu. And this can even apply as looking through the viewfinder. So this icon, the crescent wheel with the bottom half, this is our rear control wheel. So we can control through our different auto white balances. Sometimes you'll see a crescent wheel on the top that is our front control wheel. Come back. Some of these have dedicated controls, such as the focusing mode. Wow, I didn't even touch the screen. I just got close enough to it and it kind of went in there. But the auto focus mode has its own selector switch here. So that's why you can't access it. Same with the drive modes, is that we have a drive mode, a dedicated drive mode control wheel here. Our quality, we can come in here and use joystick, the directional pad. We can use the front or the rear control wheels. So there's multiple options depending on how you like to navigate. Pushing set will get us out of the menu. We can also tap on the icon itself. There are tons of customizations, lots of information. And so don't feel overwhelmed. This is turning the back display off. 
and then we're back to our regular shooting display. Something I need to point out before we get into the exposure lessons is that we need to make sure that our constant preview is turned to on. By default, when you get this, it's going to be turned off and it'll appear that you have the correct exposure. And when you push that shutter button halfway down, if you don't, you will see red values for your shutter speed and aperture. What this is saying is this is underexposed a lot. So what we want to do is to be able to preview the image before we take it. And that is found under the settings tab. It's this blue camera back icon display one constant preview. We're going to turn this to on. Once we do that, now we get an exposure preview. My advice would be to leave this on all the time with the exception of shooting in a studio because it's going to allow us to see how bright or dark our images are going to be. So that's critically important before we start this lesson. The mode dial up here on the top under where the red ring is, if you push and hold that down, there is a mode on there that says IA. That is your intelligent automatic mode. And you'll notice that when you're in this setting, the camera is pretty much doing everything for you. I refer to this as the dummy mode. And I always tell my students, try not to shoot in this mode. You spend a lot of money on this camera. Go through the trouble of, of you know, struggling to learn shutter speed and aperture control. It won't take that long and you're going to have mastery over your camera and do some amazing things. The mode dial to me, what this does is it allows us to tell the camera how much and what type of help we want it to give us. And there are really only four modes that I would emphasize, which are the P, A, S, and M modes. And the easiest way for me to explain how each of these modes work is to start off with the aperture priority mode. And this will be designated with the letter A in the bottom left-hand corner. In the aperture priority mode, we determine the aperture and the camera determines the shutter speed. The aperture is the opening of the lens. Now, when we did the button overview, I was referring to the front button as the primary selector. And if you take your index finger and you hold it straight up, it's the number one, primary. Your primary selector is going to change the primary function of the mode you're shooting in. So if you're in the aperture priority mode, your numero uno is going to change, you guessed it, your aperture. So as I hold the camera and I rotate that front control wheel, we get this yellow indicator designating that we're changing the aperture. So that's important in and of itself is to know how to change these settings. Something you should be aware of is that as I am changing the setting, I'm, I'm making the aperture smaller and smaller. We talk about aperture sizes and I give you a crash course on photography on the S1, S1R crash course. But as I am making the aperture sizes smaller, you'll notice that the exposure isn't changing. So that word exposure can be intimidating. It really means how much light, how much brightness is entering the camera. And those are really controlled by two things, our aperture, and we can't really see it right now, but our shutter speed. Aperture is the size of the opening. Shutter speed is how long it's open for. We have another control referred to as ISO, which helps us add gain to the signal. It's not clean light. It's an electric signal boost that we give, but that also plays into brightness. With this in mind, the question you should be asking yourself, if I'm changing the diameter of the opening of the lens, how come the exposure preview isn't changing? Okay, that's impossible. Something else has to be happening. And this is what's going on in aperture priority mode is that the camera is changing the shutter speed. So if we tap the shutter button, we get a temporary view of our shutter speed. So as I am closing that diameter smaller and smaller, we're getting longer and longer shutter speeds. And if I open it up in the other direction, I'm gonna bump up my ISOs just to demonstrate this a little bit better. You can see depending on which direction we go, the shutter speed is changing. So why is this happening? Well, the camera is trying to get an even exposure for us. And all we're telling it is, hey, use this aperture, you do the rest. And the camera says, okay, I got you. Professional shooters will use aperture priority mode in changing light conditions. They'll dial in their aperture 
and they'll let the camera do the rest. When I shot weddings, did this all the time. We'd be in a dark church, we'd be moving to a lobby, and then outside into the limo within 15 seconds. And in those 15 seconds, I'm also worrying about where I'm stepping. I don't want to trip over a thing. Here comes the bride and the groom. You're trying to decompose them. And it's just something else I don't want to have to worry about the shutter speed. So there are situations aperture priority is absolutely fine to shoot, even as a pro. I know a lot of sports photographers who prefer to shoot an aperture priority. Why? Because sometimes lighting conditions change. So the question you should have at this point is if changing the aperture makes the camera change the shutter speed, how do we change the brightness? That's a very good question. That's what we're gonna talk about right now. That is referred to as exposure compensation. So exposure compensation is designated with this little zero right here. I touched the screen there. It has a little plus minus next to it. The way we activate our exposure compensation is there is a button right up here, top right, to the right of the ISO button, is that when we push that, we get the exposure compensation bracket. And you'll notice that it has negative on the left, positive on the right. And you guessed it, positive is brighter, negative is darker. So if you're taking a picture and it's a little too dark, come into exposure compensation, pushing right here, and I'm gonna add this plus one. Take a picture. Well, maybe that's not bright enough. Okay, no problem, we'll come in here. You can see we have numerous ways to change. We're at plus two now. And if I was to compare those images on playback, we get a playback icon, I haven't set the date and time on the camera. And you can see that one image is brighter than the other. If this is the only thing that you take from this lesson, how to change your image brightness, you are well on your way to controlling your camera. What if the opposite is true? You take a picture, it's too bright, we wanna make it darker. No problem, we're gonna go in the opposite direction. Negative one, take a picture. Now it's darker. You can see we get this red indicator when it's writing to the memory card. So that is the heart of the matter, and I wanna take you a little bit deeper. This is the kind of stuff that I give you on the crash course, is the philosophy of use and what's going on. I'm not going to do a lot of it in this video, but I just want to demonstrate, if you take your hand, tap the shutter button, put our hand in front of the camera, watch what happens to the shutter speed. As the light is changing, the shutter speed is changing. So what's happening is the camera is constantly measuring how much light is entering into the camera and it's making those adjustments accordingly. Something else I want to demonstrate is how exposure compensation works, is that you'll notice at the zero mark, when I have a shutter speed of f4, the shutter speed, this is a fraction, 1 250th of a second, I want you to watch what happens when we go to plus one to the shutter speed. 1 125th of a second. So what's happening here is that the camera is adding twice as much light for every one indicator on this exposure compensation bar. So each one of these is, a, it's referred to as a stop. A stop is an arbitrary measure of light, and so what this means is, when we add one stop, we're adding twice the amount of light. So if we were to do the math, at zero, it was 1 250th of a second. At plus one, it's 1 125th of a second, and mathematically, we can prove that it's twice as much light. Take a guess, if we were to go up to plus two, what do you think the shutter speed would be? Yeah, about 60, there it is. If we were to go to plus three, what do you think it would be? Yeah, if you said 30, about 30, you're right. There it is. What about, I don't know, plus four? So you get the idea, we're at 15. And this also works in the opposite direction. What is twice as fast as 1 250th of a second? Well, it's right there, 500th, 1 1,000th. So that is how the math of these fractions work is that we're adding twice the amount of light. We don't have to do a full stop, we can do a third, we can do two thirds. And that is how exposure compensation works. Something that I do, depending on the light that I'm shooting in, is I will sneak a peek at my shutter speed. If you are shooting with long shutter speeds, very slow shutter speeds, 
you know, longer than one sixtieth of a second in your hand holding the camera, there's a good chance you're going to get motion blur and your pictures are going to be blurry. And if you're shooting fast moving subjects, you're going to need a much faster shutter speed, maybe one five hundredth or one one thousandth of a second, depending on how fast this sub subject is moving. So I am constantly sneaking a peek over here. And when my shutter speed is not enough, what I will do is I will bump up my ISO. So you'll notice that as we increase the ISO, the shutter speed that the camera is affording is getting faster. So the question may be, why not just shoot on crazy high ISOs like 51,200? I'll show you. I'm going to take a picture. There's 51,200 and I'm going to show you that maybe like 800, something like that. What happens is the camera is going to add this boost, right? So if we were to play back the image and zoom in, you can see it's a pretty clean image, even at ISO 800, right? So what about the image before that? And we were to zoom in, it's kind of hard to see on this monitor, but I can totally see the grain. See how grainy that is? And I'm going to jump back to the one before it. See how clean that is? So that's the trade-off with very high ISOs, is that you, as you add ISO, it's going to add grain to your image. And so we want to use the most minimal ISO that we can. I like to keep it in the 1600 to 3200 ballpark. Let's take a look at shutter priority, designated with S. In this mode, it's the opposite. We designate the shutter speed, and you guessed it, the camera is going to change the aperture. If we use slower shutter speeds, you can see the camera is making a smaller aperture given by this number. And if we decide to use really fast shutter speeds, uh-oh, something's going on here. We get this red indicator again. When you see that, what the camera is saying is that it has run into the physical limit of the lens and it cannot open it more wide in order to get an even exposure. If we, if we want to try to get that even exposure, it's not going to happen. The camera is not happy. So when you see this, what would you do? That's right. If you saw this, you would bump up your ISO to the point where the camera is satisfied. It's going to let us take that picture without giving the warning. With this in mind, can we do exposure compensation with shutter priority mode? Absolutely. We can get the indicator just above here. You can see the aperture changing as we move up and down. As we go higher and higher, it's not going to like that. And so we're back to that square one. That is how we use exposure compensation with shutter priority mode. I personally do not use shutter priority mode at all. Never. I almost always use aperture priority in manual mode, and that's about it. Let's talk about program mode real quick as designated with P. Now, in this situation, we don't have anything. We don't have shutter speed or aperture control, and I'm changing stuff, and it looks like nothing's happening, right? If we tap the shutter button, look what happens. Oh, we are changing some things. And it's both the aperture and the shutter speed. So what happens in the program mode is that we're able to select different combinations of apertures and shutter speeds if we really wanted to. And the most common mistake that I see with this is people start shooting something like this, F22 with 1 15th of a, of a second. And what happens is all their pictures are blurry and they're like, what's going on? So it does take some awareness if you're using the P mode to understand, you know, what, what is the camera doing with these combinations? Just keep in mind, again, that shutter speed should be 1 60th, maybe 1 100th or 1 200th, you know, if you're shooting outdoors at least. There are some times program mode can be used professionally. It has more to do with the flash. So when you put a flash on the camera, it changes some of the camera's behavior. We want it to be a certain shutter speed and it can happen automatically. But for the most part, I don't use P mode. And if you were my best friend and I was giving you lessons, I would say, don't even, don't even start there. I want you to focus on aperture priority. Let's talk about the manual mode. Very interesting. Now we can see we're getting this banding, slow banding on the monitor. This has to do with the myth sync between the LED lights I'm using and the refresh rate of the back monitor, which is, I think it's 1 60th it's refreshing at right now. So once it's dialed in correctly, we're good to go. Manual mode, we dial in the shutter speed and the aperture and the ISO. This is where we're telling the camera what to do with all those settings. And this is where I like to use the, the primary control wheel as being the aperture. Once this is set, 
We can also dial in the shutter speed with the rear control wheel, the secondary setting. That's the way I like to teach my students. And you'll notice something here that when we push the exposure compensation button up here, nothing happens. It says MM. MM to me means metering mode. It's metering how much light is coming into the camera. It's manual metering. So the camera is now a light meter. And this can be proven by taking our hand and basically covering the lens and it goes down to negative three. So there is no exposure compensation in manual mode. The metering bar now becomes just a light meter. And this is telling us how close we are to an even exposure or not. Manual mode, I personally use it when I have enough time. If I have enough time, I prefer manual because I can dial in everything exactly the way I want it and take the picture. If I'm short on time, I typically go aperture priority mode. Strobe shooting, almost always on manual mode as well. One feature we need to cover is something called auto ISO. If we turn down our ISO as low as it'll go, you can see this feature right here. Auto ISO turns ISO control over to the camera. And there are some situations where this is a great feature. For example, if you're shooting indoor sports and you have a set shutter speed that you want, maybe you want one five hundredth of a second and you want the specific aperture and the lighting conditions might change a little bit. Well, the ISO is now turned over to the camera. So when there are these fluctuations in lighting, you can see the ISO is changing right here. The camera will take over and change the ISO for us. The problem with this is obviously we, we don't know what those ISO settings are going to be and we leave it up to the camera and with very high ISOs you get grain. Is this another tool in the toolbox so to speak? Very common for indoor sports photographers to sometimes turn that on. That's where I would use it and that is auto ISO. But most of the time I'm dialing in my, my ISO manually for whatever setting it is. In any event that was a quick overview of the mode dial. We talked about exposure preview. We talked about exposure compensation, how to make it brighter. I've talked about each of the modes, recommended some certain settings. We'll talk about the C1, C2, and C3 in the video mode a little bit later on. When we're talking about the camera's focusing systems, they can be very complex and very intimidating. And I want you to think of this in terms of the how, the when, and the where the camera focuses. How, when, and where. This makes it super simple. The default on most cameras, when you pull them out of the box, how does the camera focus? Halfway shutter button depression. So when we push a shutter button halfway down, it engages the camera's focusing systems, pushing it down all the way, takes the picture. That's all there is to it. Next comes the when the camera is focusing, and this is controlled by the camera's focusing modes. There's three of them. We can see it indicated on our focusing mode lever, and we're gonna turn this over to AF we even get an indicator right here near the top middle part of the screen. AFS stands for Auto Focus Single. What this means is the camera is going to focus one time and when we hold the shutter button halfway down, it is not going to change. So there's our focusing target. I'm pushing the shutter button halfway down. We get a focusing lock. We hear a beep. We get this little green dot in the bottom left hand corner. And as we rotate the camera, the focal plane will not change. This is a technique referred to as recomposing. It is a very fast and easy way to get a focus lock and then change how we're framing up the image. Every photographer should know how to do it. We'll go over it in the crash course. But the heart of the matter here is that autofocus single is a one-time focus. Next, we have autofocus continuous, which when we push a shutter button halfway down, we get that beep again and we get the dot. But the difference now is that the camera is focusing over and over and over again. It is a continual autofocus. It means it doesn't stop. As long as we are pushing that shutter button halfway down, the camera is searching for something to get focus on. This is ideal for moving subjects, kids that run around or birds in flight or maybe cars or athletes, motorcycles, things of that nature. So if you have a moving subject, we want autofocus continuous. When we move our focus lever to MF, that stands for manual focus. And you can see, as soon as I flip that over, we're getting this blue indicator. And as I double tap on the screen, you can see I can zoom in a little bit. See that? 
When we zoom in, we also get the crescent moons, so we can further magnify what we're seeing. We can control that magnification view by pushing up or down. It's kind of hard to see, but the peaking is there. And we have fine control using the front control wheel to zoom in even further. It's a very handy focusing tool. But this blue outline that we're seeing is referred to as focus peaking, and I'll show you how that is controlled a little bit later. In the focusing mode, the camera is relying on us to dial in precise focus using the focus ring in the front of the camera. We can also access manual focus from our lens barrel switch that points to AF, MF, flipping that over. You can see that we're now jumping into manual focus. We get this indicator there. If you saw it real quick, it basically told us to push our cluster button and we can continue to push it to zoom in. So to magnify, look how close we're getting. Something that's very interesting about the S1 is that even though the lens barrel switch is pointing to MF, we have an autofocus option here, which means that we can focus, autofocus, when we're in manual focus. So that's very nice. And we also get the, the picture in picture or the full zoom and we can exit. Lots of powerful manual focusing tools. I'm gonna to flip the switch back forward and we're ready in our, our regular shooting mode. So there are a couple other ways we can focus as well, is that just by touching on the screen we can focus, depending on the focusing mode that we're in. Let's pick a single square. We're gonna talk about clusters. So we've talked about the how, we've talked about the when, now we are going to talk about the where. This has to do with the camera's focusing clusters. I like to think of the clusters as different ways to select the total focusing squares we have available to us. They are accessed by pressing the cluster button right here. And I also wanna demonstrate, see all these options, it can be super confusing. This guy right here, one area, this is the one I tend to use the most. As you look through the viewfinder, it's going to be pretty important to get second nature to change using the joystick. I'm left eye dominant and I shoot all cameras with the joystick when I can. However, remember this is a touch monitor. We can touch on the screen to change our focus if we're not looking through the viewfinder. See that? How fast and easy that is? There are a few other things I need to show you. Did you see what I just did there? If you push the joystick into the camera body, it's going to jump back to center. If you push it a second time, it's going to jump to the last place you had it. When the orange box appears, we also get the option to change the size of our single square, which can be really big or pretty small. The single square option is very diverse. You can use it in lots of different ways. It's the most preferred one that I have if I'm just generally shooting. However, all that said, we have a number of other clusters I want to demonstrate real quick. When we're in the autofocus single mode, we also have something referred to as pinpoint. And you're going to see this AF area drop down where we can basically determine where we're aiming. And this is a very small pinpoint, but pinpoint is more precise. If you're a macro photographer, you need to get a really, really tight focus area. You can do so using pinpoint. And then we start getting into some of these other modes, one area plus. And if you notice the cluster itself is that we have a single box can't change it as much, but we also have this area surrounding it. And what this means is that the camera is going to primarily look in the center box and then secondarily look around it. Sometimes this is good for certain kinds of sports. You know, if you're tracking a moving subject that you're having a hard time keeping in that center focusing square, the camera will look for an area of contrast outside of it. We get our oval zone, which is cool because we can select the different size. If you'll notice our back crescent wheel so we can move this around, determining the shape of what it is we want to use as our focusing square. We can pick a position. Once it's set, we hit set, and we can move that cluster around, just like as we would a single square. And see where the camera's looking? Very nice. When we come into the zone vertical horizontal, it's just what it sounds like. We can select a focusing line that is horizontal, or standing up. If we come into the AF area, rotating the back control wheel will determine how wide it is. Pushing up or to the right 
on our directional pad, we'll flip it. It's kind of one of these things that it wants you to do the opposite of where you're going. If you want to go straight, you got to push up. And if you want to go up, you got to push to the side. But this is going to allow us to have a focusing cluster in a vertical or horizontal aspect. Very interesting. It's Panasonic's the only one that I know of that, that has this particular type of feature. We also have the 225 area, and there is a way to customize this in autofocus continuous for the sake of time. Generally speaking, this is going to allow the camera to look for the area of contrast across the frame. It's going to find something and lock onto it. Pretty much an easier focusing cluster if you're intimidated. It doesn't always get it right. Keep that in mind. See there, it seems to be working okay now. Next we have our tracking mode, which allows us to designate what we want the camera to lock onto. So we get a different box, it's kind of hard to see. It is like a box with a crisscross through it. Single focus, no, no big deal. Let's flip it over to continuous. And now what happens is that as we move the camera, you can see that the focusing square is tracking the subject we chose. It's having a harder time on the blinds. So we need some contrast for the camera to lock onto, and that is a tracking mode. It's going to depend on your subject matter. Sometimes it works pretty well. Sometimes it's not going to work at all. When you have lots of contrast and lots of moving subjects, it can be easy to trick sometimes, but in certain cases, this can be really great. The last focusing cluster we have here is face, eye, and body detection. And interestingly, we get an animal detect on. What this tells me is that there are different algorithms built into the camera. Some are designed specifically to look at animal faces. I'm gonna put a picture up and let me demonstrate this real quick. With face detection on, you can see that we're even getting these crosshairs where the camera is telling us which eye it's focusing on. This works pretty well, depending on how close we are. Even if we zoom out and we're pretty backed up, it's still doing a great job and we get our green focus indicator. If we touch on something else, we can get out of it, but it's still saying, hey, I detect a face here. If we use this direct autofocus, we're gonna let the camera do most of the heavy lifting for us in terms of focusing. And eye detection for portrait photographers, especially when we're shooting with a very wide aperture, it's absolutely a game changer. Back in the day, <laughs> using, D it's funny, back in the day, using DSLR cameras, we, we would have these locked focusing squares and you could get a focus lock, but if you tried to recompose, you know, shooting wide open, you would pull the eye out of focus and that is a problem. So eye detection is extremely powerful for portrait photographers shooting with a very wide apertures. We have covered a lot of information about focusing already. We've talked about the how, the when, which are the focusing modes. We've talked about the where, which are the clusters. And there are even a few more little focusing tips I wanna give you. I'll be demonstrating these in depth on the S1, S1R crash course in real world shooting situations. That's the problem with focusing is how you focus, a lot of it depends on your subject matter. One technique you should be aware of is that we have this auto focus on button. So instead of using a halfway shutter button depression, we can use the autofocus on, and that will engage the camera's focusing systems. So when we're talking about button customizations, we can find many of them on the black screen, FN. If we push this, you'll notice that we get diagrams of the camera from the overhead view to the back view. It gives us an icon or a name. We've got our video record. It's kind of it's hard to see, but it's pointing to this, the exact specific button. And in here, we get a tremendous number of options, pages of options to customize. It's, it's insane. In the beginning, what I would recommend is hold off on this. If this is a new camera for you, if you're an intermediate photographer or you're a beginner, try not to customize anything in the beginning because what happens is we customize things and we forget what we changed. And we're like, how come my camera's not working? But when you become advanced in you know, high-end shooting, then of course customize it. And when we come through this, there are pages of buttons even. This is just the first page. Here's the second page. We can customize our front buttons. We have some virtual function buttons that appear on the back monitor that we can customize there on the touch screen. 
continue to come down, we can customize the direction of our joystick as well as our directional pad. Huge number of options. Something you're going to notice is that we don't see the customization for the shutter button. So in order to get back button focus, we have to go into the deep menu. It's under the gear icon, shutter AF. If we turn this to off, that disengages the focusing from the halfway shutter button depression. And so when I take my finger and I push it halfway down, nothing happens and then we push with our AF on button. That is how we do back button focusing. I'm going to turn that back on before I forget and lose my mind. There are some other pretty cool tools we should talk about. It's in the, we're in the deep menu obviously, but because we're here, we'll, we'll talk about some of these things real quick. Red tab, so the first two are image quality. We get some definitions of, of what the menu is that we're in. And as we come down to the focus, we start getting some of these other options, such as an autofocus assist lamp in dark situations, it'll kick on. We have focus peaking, and we can come in and determine things like how bright or the color, or to display it when we're shooting autofocus single. If we don't like that color, look at all the options in here. I've never seen so many peaking options before. Fluorescent green, awesome, right? And so this is where we would control the peaking, if we wanted to you know, adjust the speed of our one area square, we can do that as well. Lots, there's, there's so much information in the menu system. We'll cover a lot of it in this video, but on the crash course, I spend, yeah, I try to spend an hour, it's usually like an hour and a half, on all the settings and how to tweak them. It's, it's really pretty comprehensive, but for the sake of time, that is how we do back button focus and remove the halfway shutter button depression. That's how we customize our peaking adjust our focusing speeds, things of that nature. So that is our how, when, and where of focusing. Let's talk about how our focusing modes change when we are in a video shooting mode. So you'll notice as soon as I went to video mode, part of the top and part of the bottom got cropped off. What's going on? Okay, well that's the aspect ratio, 16 by nine. We have full over scan, even at 4K, which is awesome. And we still have access to most of our focusing clusters. Something that I'm noticing is that there's a pre-focus, even an auto-focus single. We should be able just to change the square without it focusing, but it's kind of locking in right now. I'm not sure if that's right. In auto-focus single, we should be able to move the focusing square around. And there's a feature in here that's referred to as continuous AF. And so it's like a pre-focus. When we turn that off and we come back out, camera's still, still pre-focusing and auto-focus single. Typically, we should be pushing the shutter button down to designate it, but it's not what I'm seeing right now. That might be a bug, I could be wrong. If you are on auto-focus continuous, then it would be expected for the camera to do the lifting. And this is very powerful technique and tool. So it looks like we're going to be kind of stuck with AFC or manual. We can flip it over to manual and just do our regular manual focusing. In auto focus continuous, we have some options in the menu that if we turn this on, it's like this pre-focus, I think this is what's going on, is we can determine the speed and the sensitivity of this. This is something you can tweak if it's not focusing fast enough for you, then maybe we'll speed it up a little bit. So very interesting. I might have some feedback for Panasonic in terms of this. We should have the option to change our focusing square on autofocus single without the camera focusing until we push the shutter button out. See, it's, it's doing it all by itself. If we wanted to go with face detection, we could do that as well. And so we're on face detection, autofocus continuous. I can zoom in, I can zoom out, and the camera should be focusing over and over and over again. If I change, if I wanna focus over here, I can. I can tap back on to the face and the camera takes over. So keep that in mind with autofocus continuous in the video mode, the camera is working, even though we don't get these green focusing boxes that we're used to. 
Let's talk about our drive modes. This is what the camera does after we push the shutter button down all the way. Kind of hard to see. It's just below the red ring on our mode dial. And we have a single square. We have the Roman numerals one, two, and then two clock icons. So what are those all about? Without coming into the menu, there's a lot of things that we would lose track of and, and not really know, but we can designate how these controls work in the first red tab under the camera icon and we have all these different options in here. And what this is going to allow us to do is to customize how our drive modes work. Burst shot one and two can be determined right here. So we have a high speed burst. If we wanna change it, we can do a medium speed burst or a low speed burst. We can also do 6K, 4K video recording. And so this is where we would customize these one and two positions. If we go a little bit further, we have a time-lapse animation feature. So we could come in and determine which of the two it'll be. And I'll have a lesson on this in the crash course where I'll do a demonstration of shooting, you know, a sunset or something that's moving so you can see how this works. You know, shooting interval setting, as soon as you turn it on, when does it start? If you wanted to set a time, you could. There's tons of options in here. How many images in the interval between those images, very powerful built-in intervalometer. So that is the setting for the second to the last clock icon. The last clock icon is the self timer. So we have a 10 second timer, a two second timer, and then we have a 10 second with three imaging timer. So if you're you know, shooting family portraits or something and you wanted to make sure that you know, everybody had their eyes open, that might be an option for you. We also have the Flicker option under certain fluorescent and sodium lamps, the color changes. We can come in and turn this on. I've noticed that when I do this, the camera kind of hesitates a little bit. We'll talk about the 4K and 6K photo options. Pretty impressive, amazing, powerful stuff. Post focus, multiple exposure. We'll talk about all these on the crash course. We'll have individual lessons for those. Coming back to the first bracketing tab. Bracketing is when we tell the camera to change certain exposure or white balance settings between each shot. So if we wanted to turn bracketing on, we would come in here and we could select whether it would be exposure or focus or white balance. Some of these are grayed out depending on what focusing mode we're in. For example, if we were to do exposure bracketing, we were given more settings below it and we could determine the exposure values, the sequence, and whether or not we push a shutter button down each time or the camera does all the shots for us. So if we wanted the steps to be three and one thirds, we're like, nope, we're gonna change that to one step. When I'm shooting bracketed images, I typically like three images with two exposure values between each. And we're only given one, so I would probably shoot five images with one exposure value to cover you know, a high dynamic range area. If we wanted to cover more, we could come up here. Sequence is the order in terms of even, under, or over exposure. And then we have the ability to determine whether we push a shutter button down for each shot or the camera does it for all of them. And that's how bracketing works. If we didn't want to do, you know, exposure, we could do focus. I usually have a lesson on focus bracketing. Very powerful. We tell the camera to change its focus position from shot to shot. How many steps, how many images, and you can use this if you're a macro photographer. It's really a great technique to keep it sharp. Talking about the silent mode, we turn this on. No sound at all. Now, something that's happening and you should be aware of is this. So what we see here is we have some artifacts. This banding is created from a mismatch of the shutter speed to the hertz of the LED light I'm shooting in. So LED lights, this is something that you'll notice. Silent mode is using an electronic shutter. And there's another artifact that if I take a picture while I'm moving in front of my blinds, is that the blinds now become slanted. This is the jello effect, also referred to as rolling shutter. And these are the two artifacts that you can expect to see when shooting with an electronic shutter. Your camera's not broken. The way to solve it is to shoot in mechanical mode. And you should be good to go. There it is. There are some other ways we can access electronic shutter. Down here, shutter type. 
So it's on mechanical. We have a complete electronic curtain. We have an electronic front curtain, which uses an electronic curtain in the beginning and then closes it mechanically. Most of the time I am shooting on mechanical shutter. And if I want to shoot in silent mode, I can just turn that on. Shutter delay is kind of what it sounds like. It's how much time do you want from the time that you actuate, actuate the shutter to the time the picture is actually taken. So as an example, is this a delay in the shutter? If we were to do a 10 second or a four second, allows me to get my hand off the camera. Almost like a quick timer. In any event, that is a quick run through of many of the drive settings we have available to us. And again, I'll be covering a lot of the stuff we didn't on the full crash course. We have actual lessons for many of these. Let's talk about white balance. There's a short answer to this and there's a long answer to this. The short answer is if you are a pure beginner, start off with auto white balance and there's a couple different flavors of it and we have the ability to tweak and adjust them. The C should stand for cool. The W should stand for warmer. If we wanted to adjust, we could come in here and tweak the Stay away from this for, for now. And I would just say, stick with your standard auto white balance and shoot. What will happen is at some point sooner or later, you're going to notice a yellow or a blue cast on your images or something just doesn't look right with the color. That would be the time to start considering changing your white balance. And in a perfect world, you would change it to the icon that you are shooting in. So if it was sunny, you would change it to the sun icon. If it was cloudy or overcast, you'd choose the cloud icon. Or if you're shooting in the shade, it would be the house with the shade. If you're shooting in tungsten light, it would be this light bulb. We have the ability to shoot on a flash. And then we have custom white balances. I'll demonstrate in a second. And then we have four different Kelvin settings. So we'll talk about these a little bit. And as a side note, if you're shooting raw images, your data is all there. And it's not as important for raw images to get your white balance set correctly. I still do it. But if you are shooting JPEG or if you are shooting video, this is far more important because we're losing a lot of information that's being thrown away as those JPEG images are being created. So the key is keep an eye on the color. If it's not working, choose the icon. If you are shooting in mixed lighting conditions, like maybe at a wedding and you have some tungsten and fluorescent and maybe a little bit of sun coming in, it can be pretty tricky. So the custom white balance allows us to choose something that's pure white. It can be a wall, it can be a bride's dress, it can be a piece of paper. And what we're going to do is we're going to push up and we're telling the camera, this is white. The camera does its thing and you'll notice that the color changed on the, on the monitor from what I had it before. So mixed lighting conditions, very powerful. If you're doing video shooting, and I'm touching, I'm pressing the white balance button on top here as I'm accessing these. We can use the Kelvin white balance and we have the ability to adjust our Kelvin white balance by pushing up on our little pad here. And the thing that I love about Panasonic is it gives you the icon of different light sources. And so what they're saying is if you're shooting in candlelight, which is a very yellow type of light, you move the slider down until it points at the candles and you're gonna notice it's blue and you're like, what is going on? Well, the camera is adding blue color to counterbalance that yellow light. Lights on the high Kelvin end tend to have more blue light in them. And so when we go very high on the Kelvin scale, we're adding yellow light and it gives you all these different settings. So if you are shooting in daylight balanced you know, 5,600K, the, the lights I'm shooting in right now are, are about 52, I think, something like that. But you can see that the camera is adjusting its color. This is the short answer. Let's talk about our camera's metering modes. The easiest way I think to access them is in our black info screen. You can see it right here. I'm gonna touch on it. We have four different metering modes. The name of the metering mode is given below it. So multi-metering mode is a general purpose we have a center weighted mode, a spot mode, and a highlight weighted mode. The easiest way for me to explain this is to talk about the spot metering mode first. And I am on aperture priority mode up here with my mode dial. 
Now that the spot mode is activated and I toggle to my display, we notice we get this crosshair. And again, aperture priority mode. Watch what happens when the crosshair goes over this headlamp I have. The exposure settings are changing. So when we talked about the modes and we're talking about exposure compensation, I took my hand and I put it in front of the camera and showed how the camera settings change. The camera is measuring a light that is entering the camera. The metering modes determine the patterns that the camera is measuring from. In the case of the spot mode, it is a very small circle around those cross hairs. And we know because when I move it even a little bit, here comes the light again. So we, we know there's a certain size to that circle in the middle in terms of the crosshair. And that's what spot metering mode does is it just measures lights in the middle and it disregards everything else. And so this is the heart of the matter with metering modes. If we come into, let's say, a center weighted metering mode, all we're doing is expanding the area a little bit more. So when we get to the extreme sides, let's see if it'll do it. I'm not doing it as much. Maybe we can try to get it on a corner. Did it go there? A little bit. Not really though. The idea on the center weighted is that we open up the size of the circle a little bit more. If you have something like the sun and you're shooting portraits, this would be mo more noticeable. Look, the battery's running out. Multi-metering mode is a really good general purpose metering mode. And this is where I recommend that beginners start. And then we have the highlight weighted, which means that the camera is going to adjust exposure based on the brightest subjects in the frame. So even if we move this around, it shouldn't change anywhere. And you can see we get this little symbol down here in the bottom. And that is how the metering modes work. For the most part in the beginning, I like spot metering mode and the multi-metering mode to start. Those two are the ones to go with. Let's talk about the Q menu real quick. This button here, when we push, we're brought into this quick menu and we can customize not only what is in here, but the layout of it as well. We can, obviously we see the rear selector wheel, we can select images within, we can touch, and each menu item in here has the ability to change things. So what are these? We have our picture styles, white balance, we have our ISO, we have some of the adjustments for JPEGs in terms of contrast, highlight, shadows, noise reduction, sharpness. We have our drive modes, we have our aspect ratio, and we have our flash modes. On the crash course, we'll be talking about the TT685 that is compatible with our Panasonic. So I'll demonstrate how to use flash, things of that nature. There's tons of great information in there. If we want to actually change the menu items in the Q menu, we would, depending on whether it's for photo or video, we would come in here, we would choose something that we wanted to change. Maybe we have a button for ISO, we don't really want it in our Q menu. Hit set, and we have pages of things we can choose from. Literally pages and pages. So if we wanted to have access to focus peaking, or you know maybe silent shutter, whatever, whatever it is that you need. Picture quality for video. This one's a good one sound recording level adjustment. So if you wanted to change, you know, from video shooting, you can do that as well. But it, it really comes down to what you want. Obviously with time, you're go going to know which one you want. And we can customize the Q menu for both photo as well as video if we wanted to. So that is the Q menu, how to access it, if you didn't want it to be a Q menu, you would push and hold. That is going to give us some options to even change what that button does. And so if you want to use it for whatever it is, just come in here, choose it, and then change it back, tap shutter button. So in any event, that is the Q menu. Let's take a look at the deep menu system, which can be accessed by pressing the menu button. This is going to be a very short overview. I know this video is kind of long already, on the crash course, we go through this in pretty great detail. Anything that's worth knowing, we cover. And if it's not worth knowing, I tell you. Navigation, you'll notice, we do have the ability to touch the screen, which is great. There are some camera systems that still don't. The way this is organized is we have our general tabs, and then we have pages within each tab, and then we have items within each of those pages. I like Panasonic's menu systems. I think they're more organized and, and easier to navigate. 
You'll notice that we have a shooting mode, which is in red for both stills and video. We have a camera setting, which is a blue gear wheel. And then we have the basic camera setup. And then we have our custom settings and our playback settings for the menu. In the first page, we're talking about shooting stills. Image quality is pretty important. The photo style, those are the recipes that the camera gives instructions to create JPEGs. And we can come in here and control which picture style we have. We, we also saw this uh, available in the Q menu. We have the ability to save our own. But what this is, is we can come in and we can change things such as our contrast, highlights, trying to get more details in highlights, shadows, saturation, hues, sharpness, and noise reduction. So a huge amount of information. If you are a beginning or intermediate photographer, my recommendation would be just don't mess with it for now. As you get more and more advanced, you may want to try, you know, portraits for shooting people or landscapes. A lot of videographers, the photo styles are super important because it allows them to tweak how the video is being saved and they, they can get more out of the video file. There's some very cool things that we can do with the S1 and the S1R for both stills and video on in terms of resolution and dynamic range. Metering modes, we talked about our aspect ratio. Picture quality, this is pretty important. If you want to shoot in RAW, you would come in here and select RAW. It's going to capture all of the information. You can shoot RAW and JPEG together. JPEG only throws away a lot of info and we don't have the processing latitude. We can't, you know, we lose some of the white balance color, some of the highlights. And so depending on what you shoot, sometimes it's better to shoot RAW. If you're shooting sports and you're getting thousands of images, sometimes it's better to shoot JPEG. Just really depends. Picture size, we can shoot smaller sizes if we want. I recommend sticking with large HLG. Think of this in terms of high dynamic range. And what this does is when we come in here, we basically have the ability to shoot in high dynamic range HLG photos. This is a little bit different than using video because we can do this in camera and it's it's basically telling us, hey, you might want to do this on a recorder, but we'll have those lessons on the crash course in terms of the HLG photo feature. And there's also a way to record high dynamic range video with an external recorder as well. High resolution mode takes advantage of the IBIS we have in our camera where the in body image stabilizer is moving and tilting the sensor to capture eight different images. It, it then takes those images and stitches them together to create a high resolution image. We're talking about 187 megapixels on the S1R, 96 megapixels on the S1. That's a lot of detail and it saves it as a raw file, which is freaking amazing. We'll have a full lesson on this on the crash course. In here we have some settings where we can come in and shutter delays, you know, so we don't shake the camera, you know, when we're pushing it. And we have some different motion blurs that we can reduce. Ideally, this is going to be on a tripod with subjects that don't really move as much. And then when we're ready to go, we can come in here and start it and shoot it. To get out, we press the Q button. So very powerful tool if you're looking for high resolution images. Definitely something to check out. Long exposure noise reduction. Anything over a second is a long exposure, and this helps reduce some of that noise that appears. We have our ISO sensitivity, basic eye dynamic range, which is a sense of a contrast control. Again, most of these are going to apply to JPEGs. Vignetting is a lens adjustment. Specifically, you're going to see it more on wide angle lenses in the corners. It's a darkening. This would clean it up. We have a diff diffraction compensation that could clean that up. It'll be interesting to see what we have lens-wise coming out. There's only a couple of them available right now. And we also have some filter settings if you wanted to come in and play with these. I think they're kind of gimmicky. So when we see some two by eight, it's telling us the number of pages in here and we can come in. I, I think these are kind of fun maybe to play with, you know, if, if you wanted to, if you wanted to record an image without the filter, you would turn that on, but lots of different filter sets. We talked about a lot of the focusing features, focus peaking. We'll have a whole lesson on flash in the crash course. 
lots of information in here. Hopefully we'll have enough time and I'll show you how to connect to your smartphone, how to turn that on. We get some other options in here. We talked about the drive modes, the bracketing, a lot of this stuff we've already covered. And that brings us to our video mode. Video quality, pretty important in here, is that when we come in here, we're given a bunch of options. This is our resolution, 3,840 pixels wide, that's 4K. Here's the number of frames per second. We have 420, 8-bit 420, that's the chroma subsampling. I have a video on YouTube that explains it. Long GOP is group of pictures, which means it's an inter-frame type of compression. We talk about this also on the video. We have our data rate and also the audio type. 60 frames per second, 4K video. Here's 30 frames per second, which is 24. We have full HD at 60 frames per second, full HD at 30 frames per second. Very important to set your resolution. So this is going to happen a lot. We'll, we'll see menu items that are turned off and you're like, what's going on? Well, it wants us to be in video mode. I'm in a stills mode and let's come back in. So here's our high speed video and we have the option to choose between 48, 60, 150. This is a fun one, 180 frames per second. Use it a lot on the GH5 for slow motion when you play it back. It's really powerful. In fact, I used this professionally for a commercial job I had on the GH5. And we'll demonstrate this on the crash course is what happens when you shoot at higher frame rates and play it back at regular speed. There it is, very powerful. Coming into the record file format, here is the high dynamic range. So it's saying record HDR video, a TV or recorder that supports hybrid log gamma is required. So I have a Ninja 5, I believe it supports it. Otherwise, you know, we have these other options here, things of that nature, but for the most part, I'm usually shooting on MP4, to be honest. We have our luminance level. Luminance values for JPEGs fall between zero and 255. This is an interesting discussion of itself. For now, I just leave it where it is. Coming down to the focus, we have our focus settings for video. I think we talked about some of those. We have our, our sound. So if you're recording high-end video, definitely get a good microphone. Definitely display that video. And if you want to adjust your levels, this is where it can be done. I'm not a fan of the audio gain because there's this fluctuation. And so I, I like the manual adjustment myself. There's a, different kinds of limiters in terms of noise cancellation. The microphone socket allows us to determine how our microphone port is supplying power. So if we have a microphone that needs power, it's pretty cool. Can plug it in, otherwise we're typically going with mic input, lavalier mic that I use a lot, or a Rode microphone that has its own power. You can see we have some other options here. Probably this is going to work with that additional adapter that fits on top of the camera. Sound input, real time versus recording sound. And then we have our HDMI recording output. So if we're recording to an, out, uh, an HDMI recorder and we want to turn off the information to get clean HDMI, this is where we would do it. As you probably know, we have IBIS, in-body image stabilization. It's very awesome. It's, so far, it seems to be pretty amazing. And when we come into this menu item here, it's asking if we want electronic stabilization. This is something that I recommend leaving turned off because it's something you can do in post typically and it doesn't look very good in camera from the tests that I've done in the past. And we have the ability to boost image stabilization. This will be a fun thing to test out. And you'll notice that a lot of the other options are turned off because those are for, I believe, stills mode. But when we come back out, I thought this was very interesting that we can prioritize our IBIS for either full frame or APS-C. This actually makes a lot of sense because if we're shooting for APS-C video, we can prioritize the stabilization. I've always seen the warping in the corners, so there may be some really nice applications with this. It's kind of confusing because we have our video icon and a lot of these options are not available unless we're on a stills mode. So operation mode, it's asking in terms of camera shake, what direction, if we're panning side to side, there's a setting for it, if we're hand holding in all directions, when should IBIS be activated? When it's a halfway shutter button depression, 
that sounds good for photos for me at least and then we have a focal length set possibly for using lenses that are not native for the S mount. So we're going to come into the blue gear wheel. Come to the top here. Photo style settings, a little confusing in here. We have the ability to determine which photo style settings appear and are available to us. Well, there are some other settings that we can turn on. We can add effects like sensitivity or white balance to those settings. Our ISO increments, we can change them in one third or one full stop intervals. We can turn on extended ISO. If we wanted more than 51,200 ISO, we'd do it here. So in our metering modes, if we want to tweak how the results are being calculated, we can do so in here by adding sixth stop increments. So if you feel like your multi-metering mode is cheating you by two six of an exposure value, you can come in here and tweak each of these. Color space is typically going to be sRGB unless you're shooting for a magazine and you'd be Adobe RGB. Exposure compensation reset has to do with when we use exposure compensation and we turn the camera off, do you want the camera to reset, for example, or do you want it to revert back to where it was? And then we get into a lot of the focusing stuff, a lot of great focusing tools. When we are using autofocus single or continuous, do you want it to focus? or do you want it to release? Sometimes sports shooters prefer the release for autofocus continuous. When we are shooting in the horizontal plane versus the vertical plane, do you want the focusing squares to jump back and forth between those two modes when you're using it? Autofocus, auto exposure lock, hold. So when you have this turned on, our focus and exposure will be locked when we're, we're activating our focus. Manual focus assist typically means a punch in or a zoom. When these different items are turned on, it's going to jump in when we are using manual focus. So if we're adjusting, you see how it's punching in in manual mode there? And so these are just different ways that we can have that assist work. So if we were in auto focus and then used manual focus, let's turn this back to auto focus single. Here's auto focus and holding the shutter button halfway down, rotate the manual focusing ring punches in. So it's, it's a way to zoom in. You can press the joystick. We can have the full display, which I think we have turned on already. Manual focusing guide, do you want it in feet or meters? This is this little setting right here. See this guy? It tells us where the focal plane is. Let's go meters. If you don't want the focus ring doing anything, we can turn that on. We could also show and hide the focusing modes. Man, there's so much information in here. Our pinpoint autofocus setting, autofocus scope setting. Right now it's in a picture in a picture. We can have it a full display. Lots of customization. Talked about the halfway shutter button depression. Half press shutter means it'll take the picture with a halfway shutter button depression. Eye sensor autofocus. Pretty sure that it'll start focusing when you look in the viewfinder. We didn't talk about some of these things. I probably should real quick. Is that we have a little sensor up here that when we put the camera to our eye, it notices it and it turns on the viewfinder only. And we can toggle through those different modes using the LVF button here on the side. So that should be EVF only. You see it's lighting up in here. This is the back screen only. This is what I use when I'm using gimbals. You see it's not turning off now. And then we have the sensor. There it goes. That's what that's all about. Looped focus frame. I kind of like it. I think it's worth leaving turned on. Basically when we have our focusing square, it's going to allow us to go from one side to the other and from up bottom when this is turned on we're, we're limited to the side and we have to focus all the way across the other side. I think it's a good one. This autofocus start point when this is turned on in the autofocus continuous mode with the 22.5 point area there's a way to show where beginning focus starts and so let's turn this on. We're in autofocus continuous mode. See now we're, we have the starting point. If I come into here hit set and so that's where it will begin focusing when you are using this 25 focus area point. So 
I'm going to turn this off and we're back to our regular focusing square. That's how it works. Q menu, we've talked about our touchscreen settings. This is the touchscreen. When you're looking through the viewfinder, this becomes known as the touch tab. So right eyed shooters should be able to enjoy this a little bit more than left eyed shooters. I just made a video about it. So you're, you're looking through the viewfinder and you're, you're able to use your, your thumb to touch the focusing square. And so it's asking, where do you want to focus? Do you want it to be exactly on the screen all over or offset? So if you're focusing here, it'd be relative. I can't use it because I am left eye dominant. My nose is right here. And that's a, the, the eye relief is actually pretty good. But on some cameras, when this touchpad is active, your nose will be touching it. So you're going to have to make the decision based on your nose shape, I guess. I use the joystick when I'm looking through the viewfinder, you know, so I leave my touch tab turned to off. Right eyed shooters, you might want to try it out. Lock lever settings. Here's the lock lever right here. And so when we turn the lock lever on, what do we want it to lock? If we don't want it locking the joystick, we would leave it here. All these other things, when we flip that over, let's come back into our single square here. So you can still move this, but it's locked out the other items. So this basically, see it's saying, you can't, you've locked it out. <laughs> so if you bump things and you don't you know, wanna accidentally mess something up, that's what the lock lever will do for you. FN button set. So the setting can work in the play or the record mode. So when you're shooting versus playback. There it is. We talked about it. We accessed this on the black screen. So lots of ways to customize. And we have a virtual button screen. It's right here that we can customize to appear on playback. So we would have these tabs appearing that we can use. It's pretty cool. So the function lever setting, we have this switch in the front of the camera on the bottom as we hold it left part of the camera. Uh, this will allow us to determine what function we want to control. And if there is more than one feature in there, you will be given some options. It really depends on what it is. If there's only one feature in there, it will just say on or off. Again, this is totally up to you. So we, we got these three buttons on top of the camera, white balance, ISO, and exposure compensation. And this is asking, do you want them to be active while pressing and holding down or, or after pressing and releasing? These two are the same, except uh, there's an exception for exposure compensation. So these next two, ISO displayed, it's asking when the ISO button has been pressed, do you want to change it with the front or the rear dial? We have some different options to choose from. Same with the exposure compensation. Do you want to change it with your your front and rear dials, up and down. If you wanted to go up and down, you could. Just so many options for customization, it's ridiculous. Dial set allows us to customize how the dials rotate, which directions, if you didn't like them changing shutter speed or aperture. Some of this is can be pretty confusing. So again, beginning and intermediate photographers, I would not mess with it. Headphone volume, depending on what modes we're shooting in. Never seen that on a camera before. Joystick setting. Illuminated buttons, I like that. Video record button, if you have a remote. Auto review, when you take a picture, do you want the picture to be shown immediately or not? Constant preview, this is your exposure prediction. We talked about it, should be on. Level gauge, I like that, but sometimes it gets in the way. It just depends if you want it displayed all the time or not. We got histograms, grid lines. So if you wanted a grid and you're shooting, it would be worth coming through and, and checking a lot of this stuff out you know, in terms of how much of it you want available. Center markers, autofocus area display is a good one. Live view boost, this could be a battery drainer, my understanding is, in terms of the frame rate. The EVF, my understanding, it will do 120 frames per second. I'm gonna turn that off. We have monochrome live view, we have a night mode. If you turn it on, everything goes red. Where do you want the information appearing in your live view display? It's both for the live view and the monitor. Exposure meter. Focal length displayed when we were zooming in and out. You guys remember that? There it is. So a lot of these are displays, previews. The number of images or videos remaining. When we're pressing the display button, 
Do you want some of those displays like the black screen or the control panel to not be shown? You can turn those off. We have blinking highlights. If you overexpose an image, let me just do this for you real quick. So if we overexpose something. We'll play that image back. See how it's blinking? That's your highlight display zebra pattern. If you turn your zebras on, it'll show you where your overexposure is. I have it turned up way high. We can also come in and set this and turn it down, depending on what percentage you want zebras to show. HL view assist has to do with when we're shooting in HLG modes, we can determine the appearance of certain gamuts on our monitors or not. This is a better lesson to demonstrate with my external recorder. Pretty sure I'd like to do that on the crash course. The sheer overlay is kind of cool. It allows us to take a picture of something and have it transparent on the screen. So I took a picture of my hand. If I hit set, tap my shutter button. Now we have this transparent overlay. This is not multiple exposure mode. This is just an overlay appearing on our monitor. And there are some interesting applications when shooting plates and things of that nature. Where if you're trying to frame up certain things exactly in certain positions, this could be very helpful. Image stabilization status scope. So what I think this is, it allows us to pick a point. And obviously image stabilization is working, but I'm moving the camera around a little bit and it is fighting to maintain stabilization. Yep, that's what's happening. That green dot is showing us the counter action of the image stabilizer. See, because the point on the blinds right there, see how the crosshairs pretty much stay on it? And so when I move the camera one way or the other, we're seeing the image stabilizer kind of fight the direction. That's a very cool thing. I've never seen that before. So it's your IS status scope. Lens focus resume. When this is turned on and you focus at a point and turn the camera off, it'll remember where your focusing square was. Focus control ring determines how sensitive the focus control ring is, whether it's nonlinear or linear. We can set how much we want to turn it. I would kind of not mess with it for now. And then we're into the camera settings. Might be a good time to set up some of these things. Formatting a memory card will erase your memory card. We have the double card slot function. So if we're recording, basically I'm recording from card one to card two, but if I wanted to do backups, so at the same time, or we can set videos to one and stills to the other. Really depends, a lot of pros will shoot with the backup feature on, so they have two. We can determine the destination slot if we're using, for example, that first one. We have the ability to select different folders. We can create a new folder. Just made a new one right there. We can change the file name. We can either using the folder number or the user setting. So we can come in here. We can change the lettering if we wanted to. File number reset allows us to determine that when we swap out our memory cards, do we want the counters to start over? We have the ability to embed our copyright information in terms of our name or maybe our business. If you wanted to do this, you'd come in and determine the set, spell your name out, whatever, and then it would save it to the individual files. For our power saving modes, we can determine when it'll go into sleep mode, things of that nature, timers. I have the time to sleep turned off because I'm teaching right now. The frame rate for the monitor, so back monitor, 30 to 60 frames. Electronic viewfinder, we can go up to 120 frames per second. We have our monitor settings in terms of brightness, contrast. We have saturation, so you can tweak all those settings. So our monitor backlight, look at the letters, how the letters will change when I turn this on. See how much brighter it is? Or we can have it on auto. We have our battery level. We can get, do it at this, or we can have a percentage. The status LCD, same thing. Do you want it backlit? Display while well, the power is off. Talking about up here on top of the camera, we have a, a few icons. The eye sensor we've talked about, we can determine the sensitivity. If you want to adjust the level, you can. Hopefully we'll have time to talk about the Wi-Fi. I'd like to get through that. We can turn the beep off. 
here are the sounds for electronic shutter, autofocus, autofocus volume. I think we have uh, uh, the tone we can even change. Yep. Tone for the shutter, electronic shutter. Headphone volume, pretty important for monitoring audio. We have our Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, USB settings so we can determine how the USB port is being used. I like USB power supply as an option if I need to charge the camera, battery information, TV connection stuff. Man, there's so much information in here. The custom modes, we didn't talk about these. Those refer to the C1, C2, and C3 on top of our camera settings. So if you are doing a specific type of shooting, set your camera up the way you like it, whether it's autofocus continuous with a certain cluster, with a certain white balance, with a certain picture style, come into the menu and save it to custom mode and you can choose which one you want. So the C1 and C2 refer to those first two positions. The C3, we designate which out of those three we want the C3 on top of the camera to refer to. That's what's going on. So we can really save five positions, but only three can be on the dial. We have our custom mode settings in terms of the limit, the number of custom modes. We can edit the titles of those custom modes. So if you wanted to name it portrait shooting, sport shooting, whatever it is, you would be able to recognize that. Look at all the custom modes we, we have in there on that C3 position now that we, had, we added five. How to reload a custom mode is asking, how do you want the custom mode to be turned on? Right now it's by, def by the mode dial, we changed the recording mode. You can also set this up to work if you power the camera on from a sleep mode or if you just turn the camera on. That'd be annoying, I think. And that we can even determine some of the details available. Right now it looks like it's just aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and white balance. We could save camera settings to a memory card if we wanted to transfer it. This is where we'd come in and I believe load to a certain one. And we can reset our custom settings. Then we have things like our clock, time zone, pixel refresh is when you get dead pixels. You'll see it as a white or a red pixel on every single image. This would remap the sensor, pretty powerful. Sensor cleaning we talk about on the crash course. I'll demonstrate how to do it. Language, hopefully you're an English speaker if you're watching this. Firmware version tells us the software for the body and the lens. Often camera manufacturers will update shortly after release of a camera when there's bugs. I've noticed a couple weird things already. Maybe we'll, we will see it. You typically load it to the memory card. Some cameras will let you connect directly to a computer. There is the online manual. We have a URL for it. So if you wanna find the online manual, there it is. The regulation displays there. We also have our My Menu settings. I think the most useful things in here are gonna be like format card, right? After some time, you're only going to use certain settings, okay? There's no need to go through probably like over 100 different menu items to find the one thing. In order to add items, we wanna come down to this pen icon and hit add. In 31 pages, I just want the format. Let's see if we can find it. Clock zone, online manual. And this is going to let us scroll through pretty much most everything that we just went through. And we can find that one thing that we, we really want, card format. Do you want to save this to the position? Yeah. Double card slot function, that's another good one, yep. And at that point, we come back out, and then in the My menu on page one, we have these two options, so I don't have to go looking for it in the deep menu. And this is gonna happen, there's gonna be a few things you're gonna want on there. We can sort them, we can delete them, and we can also turn on display for my menu. When you do this and you go into the deep menu, it's going to open up that purple tab straight away. If I come in here, just like that, tap the shutter button, hit that, and we're back at the purple tab. When that's not turned on, it usually remembers the last one you were at. Pretty important navigation stuff for the life of your camera to know how to do that. And then we have our playback mode. So when we're playing images back, do you want them to be rotated? Do you want them to be sorted by date and time or maybe the file name? We can magnify using the auto focus point. I think that's a good one. But you know, we can also magnify, I'm pretty sure by just playing, touching and dragging or playing. We can also 
swipe from side to side. We have a HLG view assist mode. Again, this has to do with those different displays. Come back in. We can process raw images. We have our 6K, 4K options in terms of bulk saving, time-lapse video to play. We can protect our images or rate them. These will not be saved from fi uh, formatting the memory card. We can resize, rotate. There's a lot of information in here. So much information. If you wanted to resize, we could. If you wanted to copy, if you wanted to trim a video. Most of this stuff, I don't do it in camera. I do it on a computer screen so I can see everything. And how do you want the images to delete do you want it to be on yes first or no first? So if you play, play an image back and you hit the garbage can icon, what do you want? So if you want to delete the hand, do you want this to be highlighted yes or highlighted no for the first button press? So there's a ridiculous amount of customizations. There's a ridiculous amount of menu items. It's just a quick overview as fast as I could. And on the crash course, we will cover all the important things in depth. And I hope you enjoyed it. I wanted to demonstrate how to connect with our camera to our smartphone. In this example, I'm going to be using an iPhone 10. I have downloaded the Lumix Sync app. So if you have an Android, there should be a comparable app on the Google Play Store. When you download the app, come into the menu, come into Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi function. And what this is doing is it's turning on the Wi-Fi signal of the camera, new connection, we're going to demonstrate the sh uh, live view shooting and viewing. We can also have it send images while we were recording. And it's basically saying it has turned on a Wi-Fi signal from the camera. It's called S1A6DB58. So what I'm going to do is come into my Wi-Fi settings. Let's see if we can find it. Here it is on the bottom. And we're going to select that Wi-Fi signal. And it says if you haven't launched the application, now would be a good time to do that. We're going to come out. It's right here. So we've launched the app. They're starting to get to know each other. Lumix Sync would like to access your photos. Sure. Welcome to this Sync app. So what it wants us to do is to come back into our Bluetooth to pair it with the phone. It's kind of a, kind of a weird thing. We're gonna come in, we're gonna turn we're going to set, we're going to pairing. And it's saying, please register the camera from the home of the Lumix Sync and detect the following device name. There it is. So kind of a tricky thing is that it wants us to sync with Bluetooth first before it'll actually recognize and give permission to communicate with each other. It's gonna go through this little setup thing. And then we're given notice that it's connecting through the Wi-Fi. Now we're given this notice that the app wants to join the S1 network that this is putting out. Once you register and pair them together, it should be easier to connect in the future just by turning the Wi-Fi on. So we're gonna hit okay. And then when we, when we get all these overlays showing, we know we're in business. So there's a couple things we can do here. We have a remote shutter control, which really is just a single way to take a picture by tapping on the screen. We can also do video recording here, which is remote, very nice. Start and stop video recording. It's coming back out. We can also import images from our camera into our smartphone. It wants to establish another connection. It looks like it's trying to do most of this on Bluetooth and then when we're doing other features, it'll jump back. So sometimes you're gonna run into problems like this. It says our smartphone is unable to connect or the Wi-Fi uh, connection has a problem. So it's taking us back to our settings. Yeah, it jumped back to my home network. So you might run into some problems with this. It's not the cleanest connection and see it dropped me out just after a few seconds. I didn't touch anything. Something to keep in mind is that when we have the Wi-Fi connectivity, it'll be highlighted here and when it's just Bluetooth, this will be grayed out. 
We have the ability to import images if we want. It's telling us which memory card we've shot from, how many images we have left. There's my hand. We can go to our SD card or our XQD card. We can select multiple images. So come in and hit select. So if I wanted to download these images, very useful for social media stuff. This is your thing. Come back out. To me, the most useful thing, in my opinion, is the remote shooting because it's going to give us control over things like focusing. We should be able to change our focusing score. Let's see if it's working. Take a picture. We have obviously certain settings up here. We have our picture styles, the picture quality for JPEG, which focusing mode we have. I think it's our drive mode. We have our Wi Fi, Bluetooth the image stabilization, we have our side tabs available. Shutter speed, aperture, exposure compensation, ISO, which memory card, we can adjust our white balance, our ISO, touching and dragging, if we wanted to brighten it up. Our shutter speed, we have access to our quick menu, very nice. Lots of good features in here. Obviously, here's our still button, tap to take a picture, Video recording also available. Really, really good stuff. We can toggle our displays. So this is something that I, I do occasionally use, just depending on what I'm doing. So if I come in here and mess this up, turn that back on, there it goes. Looks like it's doing its, its pre-focused thing and we can take a picture that way. We can customize these side menus as well. We can get this to show up on the camera Obviously, we can get more features in here. Probably the most useful thing about the connection is this remote shooting. We have a few options in here. We can turn off the camera, things of that nature, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth setup. So that is an overview of how to pair and connect our camera with our smartphone through Bluetooth and then Wi-Fi. When we're talking about lenses for our S1 or S1R, at the time of this recording, this camera is brand new. We don't have many native lenses. In fact, the 24 to 105 is the only lens that I've used on it so far. We know that there's a 70 to 200 f4 coming. There's a 50 millimeter 1.4 coming. Sigma has announced the L series for its Sigma art lenses to work natively, but those lenses have not been released. And there's also the Sigma MC21 adapter, which should allow us to use Sigma art lenses and Canon EF lenses with the EF mount. I hesitate to recommend it because I haven't used it but I'm sure with time we're going to be seeing many adapters and, and the compatibility will improve and things of that nature. If you are a video shooter, you are definitely going to want to get an external microphone. I like the Rode onboard microphones. I've been using them for years. They're pretty good for general purpose shooting. I'm using an E100 Sennheiser lav mic for this video. I use it all the time. And you're going to want to get some kind of stabilization in terms of a tripod. I like the Bogan Monfrotto series. I use the carbon fiber legs. And there's another company called Me Photo that has something that's very comparable. I'm a huge believer of getting a locking ball head in any event. If you found this video helpful and you gained some value, but you're still struggling to learn how to shoot in real world situations, you're probably going to want to check out my Panasonic S1 and S1R crash course, where I will take you on location and show you what I am thinking and doing to get spectacular results. If it's not the fastest way to learn your camera, I will give you a refund. In any event, thank you again for joining me. Have a great day and I will see you on the crash course.